Hey everyone, I'd like to uh, talk to you about functional or secondary mitral regurgitation. Um, and uh, uh, just so you know that uh, functional and secondary mitral regurgitation are interchangeable nomenclatures. So if you see functional or secondary, they kind of mean the same thing. So just keep that in mind. So let's start off by reviewing the mitral valve anatomy. Um, many of us uh, think about the mitral valve in terms of the leaflets, the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet, but there's a lot more to the mitral valve than that. First of all, the leaflets are surrounded by an annulus that supports the valve. There are chordae tendinae that uh, connect to papillary muscles that connect to the LV wall. There's the surrounding myocardium. And then there's the left atrium as well. So if anything goes wrong with any of these structures, the mitral valve is gonna become dysfunctional. So it's not just a leaflet issue, it's actually the whole apparatus that we have to learn about. Now Carpentier came up with a specific classification to try to uh, really identify the different mechanisms that cause mitral regurgitation. And he divided these into three groups. So type one is a dilated annulus or a perforated leaflet that causes the mitral regurgitation. And you can see in this uh, cartoon here, this is trying to demonstrate that the uh, annulus is dilated. So that's called a type one. A type two lesion is a prolapse or myxomatous disease. As you see in the cartoon here, this line represents the annulus and you see the billowing of the leaflets into the left atrium, which is typical of myxomatous disease. And then uh, the third type is a type three, which is restricted leaflets. And there's a 3A and there's a 3B. So a 3A is restriction of the posterior leaflet in systole and diastole and a type 3B is restriction only in systole. Functional or secondary mitral regurgitation fits into the type 3B category. So why is this important? It's important because the management of these lesions are vastly different. So here is a flow diagram that is uh, borrowed from the 2020 ACC AHA valve guidelines. And this figure uh, demonstrates the, uh, the thought process and the recommendations for the management of primary mitral regurgitation, which means that there is something wrong with the valve leaflets themselves. And most commonly, that is degenerative or myxomatous disease, uh, which are perfect examples. So in this case, we have severe mitral regurgitation that is established by our um, criteria. And then we look at, is the patient symptomatic or asymptomatic? If the patient is symptomatic, then the um, treatment of choice is mitral valve surgery, or if the individual is of prohibitive risk for surgery, then they qualify for a transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge mitral valve repair, assuming of course that the anatomy is suitable. For those individuals who um, are uh, surgical candidates, we look at either is the, uh, the valve disease degenerative or uh, myxomatous, and those cases repair is preferable if, uh, if that's an option. And uh, individuals with rheumatic disease, um, there is a, a, a more inclination for uh, mitral valve replacement um, and only repair if the repair will be durable and done at a, a center of excellence. If there are no symptoms, but uh, there's LV systolic dysfunction or marked dilatation of the left ventricle, then that patient falls into the surgery category. If they are asymptomatic and have normal LV function, the left ventricle is not dilated um, there is a class two indication for mitral valve repair if they have suitable anatomy, um, or a 2B if there's a progressive increase in size um, of the left ventricle or a decrease in the ejection fraction over at least three studies. For individuals who are asymptomatic and do not meet any of these criteria, then serial monitoring is recommended. <clears throat> 
On the other hand, secondary or functional mitral regurgitation is treated very differently. As you see here, the first uh, uh, treatment for patients with secondary mitral regurgitation is goal-directed medical therapy supervised by a heart failure specialist. For individuals um, who um, have severe stage D disease, which means that they're symptomatic, if their ejection fraction is normal and they continue to have symptoms despite goal-directed medical uh, therapy and treatment of atrial fibrillation, if AFib is present, then it's a class 2B indication for mitral valve surgery. If their ejection fraction is depressed and um, their symptoms are present despite goal-directed medical therapy, if they have amenable anatomy, then transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair is um, recommended. If they have severe symptoms and uh, do not have anatomy favorable for edge-to-edge -edge repair, then mitral valve surgery is indicated. For those individuals who are scheduled to undergo cabbage and have severe MR, it's a class 2A indication to undergo mitral valve surgery. And in these cases, cordal sparing mitral valve replacement may be a reasonable option to choose over a downsized annuloplasty repair. So you see that the treatment algorithms for functional or secondary mitral regurgitation is vastly different that, uh, than that of primary mitral valve disease, which is why it's important as um, imaging specialists that we accurately identify the mechanism of mitral regurgitation on the echocardiogram because that will lead the patient on a different treatment path depending on the etiology that we identify. So let's look at some examples. So here is a patient with type one mitral regurgitation because of a dilated annulus. This was um, a study done a few years ago from my colleague, Dr. Nasheen Akhtar, who demonstrated that using 3D echo, um, we can clearly show that um, the annulus and patients with type one mitral regurgitation is much larger than those uh, individuals who are the controls. Type two uh, mitral regurgitation is myxomatous uh, disease as shown here. This is an individual with a flail anterior leaflet with associated significant mitral regurgitation. And this patient uh, was referred for surgical correction because of symptoms. And here are the 3D images demonstrating the uh, flail scallop, um, the flail A2 scallop with the ruptured cord and associated mitral regurgitation. Now, uh, this is a type 3B lesion, and this is an example of a patient that has rheumatic disease. The uh, stenosis in this case is predominant over the regurgitation, but uh, for um, just example purposes, this is a uh, leaflet that's restricted in systole and diastole, causing mitral regurgitation, and this is of a rheumatic etiology, and this is a type 3A lesion. And then a type 3B is uh, restriction in systole. And uh, this is your typical uh, functional or secondary mitral regurgitation. You see here that uh, the ventricle is dilated. There's an associated anterolateral uh, wall motion abnormality. You see that there's marked tethering of the leaflets and associated mitral regurgitation. When we look, um, at additional views, again, you see the associated wall motion abnormality here in the inferior wall and note the marked tethering of the leaflets. And here on the 3D echo, you see the restriction of the posterior leaflet here, particularly of the P3 scallop, which is the most common uh, scallop to be restricted in this type of mitral regurgitation. And this gives the appearance on the 3D echo of a crooked smile. So just Keep the crooked smile um, in your uh, memory banks because this is pretty typical of functional or secondary mitral regurgitation. So now what's the mechanism? Why does uh, mitral regurgitation happen in this particular instance? So this is work that was done by Bob Levy and colleagues several years ago. And his group showed that the mitral valve leaflet closing position 
is determined by two opposing forces. There are tethering forces, which is trying to keep the valve from closing. And there's the closing forces, which are trying to keep the valve closed. So when you have greater tethering force, it results in apical displacement of the leaflet. Because you can see here that um, the uh, tethering force is actually pulling on that mitral valve and trying to keep it from moving uh, towards the annulus and is closing actually in a more apical location. And that's what we call tethering. And uh, here's um, a slide that was uh, borrowed from my colleague, Judy Hung. Um, and this uh, uh, definitely uh, tells you that the posterior leaflet here is restricted and you end up with an end to side configuration. Instead of having the anterior and the posterior leaflet meet at the tips, you have the anterior leaflet meeting at the side of the posterior leaflet. Um, and so you have the end to side configuration and this results in that posteriorly directed jet of mitral regurgitation, which is typical for this uh, type of lesion. Now, when um, the uh, functional mitral regurgitation is due to an ischemic process, more commonly a circumflex infarct leading to an infralateral wall motion abnormality, we call that subset of functional mitral regurgitation ischemic mitral regurgitation. And that's the most common time where you get this end to side configuration. So here's an example of a moving uh, image of a patient that had a circumflex um, infarct. You see there is an anterolateral wall motion abnormality here at the base. Note the restricted motion of that posterior leaflet, particularly in systole. And notice the end to side configuration uh, of that anterior leaflet. And then again, you see that posteriorly directed jet. And um, here I made a little cartoon to show you how the anterior and the posterior leaflets should coapt in the normal situation. You see that the coaptation is, is right here at the tips. And here's what it looks like when it's an end to side configuration or confi um, end to side coaptation. And when you have this little curl here uh, on that anterior leaflet, that's known as a seagull sign which is typical of this type of MR. So the mechanism for uh, ischemic mitral regurgitation, which again is a subset of the functional mitral regurgitation, the incidence is higher for inferior versus anterior myocardial infarction. So why is that the case? So anterior MIs may cause more global LV remodeling However, the inferior MIs cause more alterations in the mitral valve complex. So this is shown here in these cartoons. And again, this is from uh, Bob Levy's uh, publica publication on this topic back in 2008. Yeah. You see here what the normal configuration of the mitral valve and the mitral valve apparatus looks like, and this should result in no mitral regurgitation. Here is an individual who had an extensive anterior myocardial infarction with quite a bit of dysfunction of the, um, of the left ventricle. But you see that the mitral valve apparatus is preserved so that the leaflet configuration is relatively normal. Contrast that with this individual who had an inferior MI, you see the displacement of the papillary muscles and uh, the dysfunction of the uh, infralateral wall. And all of that results in significant tethering of the mitral valve leaflets preventing closure. And that tethering often affects the inferior, I'm, I'm sorry, the posterior leaflet more than the anterior leaflet, which gives you that end to side configuration and the posteriorly directed jet of mitral regurgitation. So here's a live example of a 65-year-old female who had a circumflex infarct. You see on the parasternal long axis view that the infralateral wall is akinetic and um, there is some tethering of that mitral valve. 
Okay, and you act, if you look very carefully, you can see that end to side configuration of the valve right here. And here's the associated mitral regurgitation. On the short axis view, you see that there's akinesis of the inferior and the infralateral wall. On our four chamber view, we see that the left ventricle is severely dilated. The ejection fraction is depressed at 32% and the annulus is dilated. You see that there is significant mitral regurgitation. And when we do our PISA calculation, uh, we find a um, effective regurgitant orifice area of 0.32 centimeters squared, which technically is moderate, but uh, keep in mind that in uh, functional mitral regurgitation, the uh, PISA, uh, the, the hemisphere is often shaped like a, 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 a concentric configuration or crescent configuration rather than a sphere. And that often underestimates um, the uh, effective regurgitant orifice area. If we look at other parameters of um, uh, mitral regurgitation severity, we see that there's E-wave predominance. And then in the pulmonary veins, we have a very blunted S-wave with a hint of, of systolic flow reversal. So despite the ERO suggesting moderate um, regurgitation, the mitral inflow and the pulmonary veins suggest that it is severe. And here now we look at the apical three chamber view and you see the marked akinesis of the entire infralateral wall. And uh, here you see that end to side configuration and the restriction of that posterior leaflet. Note how displaced the, papil info, uh, the posterior medial papillary muscle is and how taut this cord is. And you can see how it's causing tethering of the leaflet. And here's that inferiorly or posteriorly uh, directed jet of mitral regurgitation. So now this patient was placed on um, maximally tolerated goal-directed medical therapy, including ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, spironolactone. Um, and you see that after a year of intensive medical therapy, her left ventricle has diminished in size, the ejection fraction has, in, uh, de the ejection fraction has improved, and the mitral valve annulus is smaller. And you see here that the severity of mitral regurgitation has diminished. If we look at our quantitative parameters, our ERO has decreased to 0.11 centimeters squared. You see that the jet of uh, the, the spectral Doppler signal of the mitral regurgitation is less dense. We now have A wave predominance in the mitral inflow instead of E wave predominance. And we start to see uh, evidence of a more prominent S wave. So all markers that mitral regurgitation has become less severe as a result of goal-directed medical therapy, which improved the function of the left ventricle. So in functional mitral regurgitation, the problem isn't the mitral valve, it's the surrounding myocardium and the mitral valve apparatus. So we have to target our treatment towards those structures in order to treat the mitral regurgitation. Now there's another type of functional um, mitral regurgitation I wanna make you aware of, and that's atrial functional mitral regurgitation. So this kind of mitral regurgitation typically occurs in the context of atrial fibrillation and or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So here's a cartoon that I borrowed from the publication in the Journal of American College of Cardiology back in 2019. And you see here the secondary or functional type of mitral regurgitation that we just discussed with the uh, infralateral wall motion abnormality, displacement of that uh, postromedial papillary muscle, taut cords resulting in tethering of the mitral valve uh, leaflets, particularly that posterior leaflet with that eccentric posteriorly directed jet. This is in contradistinction from the atrial functional mitral regurgitation, in which case the left atrium is enlarged. This causes 
di um, dilation of the annulus pulls the leaflets apart and causes a, uh, a jet of mitral regurgitation that tends to be central in nature. So again, atrial functional mitral regurgitation occurs because of a problem with the left atrium more so than the left ventricle. Isolated annular dilatation, insufficient leaflet growth, and impaired annular dynamics are the mechanics that are the culprits of this type of mitral regurgitation. And early discrimination between atrial functional mitral regurgitation and secondary mitral regurgitation due to diseases of the left ventricle is pivotal to accommodate for different therapeutic needs. So in this case, the therapy needs to be aimed at treating the atrial fibrillation or the hype failure and preserved ejection fraction or whatever seems to be driving that left atrial enlargement as opposed to this example where our target is really treating the left ventricular dysfunction. Uh, further study is needed to clarify the impact of um, early rhythm restoration in individuals with atrial fibrillation um, in terms of strategies uh, for mitral annular interventions and to treat atrial functional mitral regurgitation. So again, just to summarize the pathophysiology of atrial functional MR, this oftentimes results in patients who have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and or atrial fibrillation. These conditions cause an increase in the left atrial size and in left atrial pressure that leads to annular dilatation and then the atrial functional MR as a result. Here's an example of a 67-year-old female with atrial fibrillation. You see here that her annulus is dilated. She has severe left atrial enlargement and a normal ejection fraction. Here's the mitral regurgitation. Um, her ERO is about 0.15 centimeters squared with a regurgitant volume of 27. We do have a blunted S wave in her um, uh, pulmonary venous pattern and a fairly dense MR signal. So despite that ERO being on the lower side, all the other parameters suggest that this is moderate in severity. So she undergoes atrial fibrillation ablation and you see here that her left ventricular function has improved. Her left atrium is enlarged still but smaller than it was before. Her annulus has also decreased in size and you see now that her mitral regurgitation has decreased from moderate to trace. So what are the things of this lecture do you need to know about functional or secondary mitral regurgitation for the boards? First, understand the mechanisms that cause functional or secondary mitral regurgitation. Be able to recognize the typical echo appearance of each type of mitral valve disease and how they are different. Understand the differences in the mechanisms and the differences in treatments between functional and organic mitral regurgitation. And this will help you not only in pass your exam, but will also help you better take care of your patients that have mitral regurgitation. So thank you for your attention and good luck on the exam.